Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course. And this module is on wireless networking. I'm James Messer. And in this module, we're going to discuss the requirements from our CompTIA exam 220-701, section 4.3, where we need to compare and contrast the different network types, everything wireless. We're going to go through 802.11. We're going to talk about some encryption configurations. And lastly, some settings and configurations you can do to help configure and protect your wireless access points. If you've ever walked into a, an electronic store and you've looked at all of the different wireless access points that are up there, you'll notice that there are quite a few differences between them. A lot of different models, a lot of different flavors. So we need to have a better understanding of when we look at one of these devices, what are they really talking about? What are they really referring to? So let's first start with what are all of these different 802.11 wireless networks? First, you need to understand that we've used this term 802.11 almost as a catchphrase just for wireless networking. What it's referring to is a standard group within the IEEE. And the IEEE is a standards organization that tells everybody else exactly the way these wireless networks are to operate. It's a consortium of different people and different companies all coming together and deciding on how all of this technology should really work. Currently, there are four standards in use that we use for these wireless networks. 802.11a, b, g, and n. And you may see these used in different places in different ways. You need to have an understanding of what all those are. We'll step through each one of those in this module. One thing to keep in mind is depending on the different types, depending on the different technologies in use, these may use different channels, different frequencies, we call them, different distances, different ways that they communicate. There are a lot of differences between these. This happens to be a very good example of some of the 2.4 gigahertz connections, uh, communication frequencies that we use on some of our networks. And notice there's a lot of overlap between them. We've got these 22 megahertz ranges that are used for a single channel. So channel 6 uses this big range. And the, you'll notice on, for instance, 802.11b, we might have a, somebody on channel 1, somebody on channel 6, and somebody on channel 11, because you'll notice none of those channels overlap with each other. Generally, we don't use any of the ones in between unless there's something else out there that's creating a conflict. And then we also know that we would never want to overlap with anyone else that's near us. So generally, you'll see 1, 6, and 11 configured on your access points. Just one of the things you need to keep in mind when you're planning to deploy a wireless network. Let's start with talking about 802.11a. It's a good place to start because it was one of the initial wireless standards that was brought out in October of 1999. And it also operates in a range that we don't see on 802.11b, such as the 5 gigahertz range. So it's a very different type of frequencies that were in use. 802.11a and 802.11b came out at about the same time. But 802.11a really focused on that 5 gigahertz range. 802.11a also had a very high speed for wireless at the time, 54 megabits per second, which was well above the capabilities of the 802.11b. We're going to talk about b in just a moment. Even though it was a faster speed, it used a smaller range of frequencies. And this higher frequency got absorbed by devices that were in the way. So the distance wasn't quite as far as you could go. You had a, a much smaller range that you could use your 802.11a networks in. You saw a lot of these in being used in very large open environments, like warehouses. There was quite a lot of 802.11a that was in use, and still some today. A uh, rule of thumb is you can take about a third of the range of an 802.11b, and that would be what you would find for an 802.11a network. 802.11a was used, but, but really only in very specific places. And because of that, you really don't see very widespread use of this technology. The, really, we had such a, an onslaught of 802.11b devices that the prices of those chips and the amount and the availability really dropped quite a bit. So it really became the, the primary and really the focus of where people were putting their wireless technologies. I mentioned before that 802.11a and 802.11b came out at about the same time. 802.11b was a completely different format, a completely different structure in the way that it operated. And the first thing we'll notice is it operates in a completely different set of frequencies, the 2.4 gigahertz range. This also had much slower speeds, not the 54 megabits per second that A had. This only went 11 megabits per second. And your real throughput was really much lower than that. 
but it had much better range. You had less absorption of the traffic, of the communication going through the air. And so you could put it in a much wider business type environment, not have to worry so much about devices getting in the way, if you would. However, the 2.4 gigahertz range also had a lot of other devices inside of it. If you use a 2.4 gigahertz 802.11b G network, you'll notice that your maybe your mobile phone, your wireless cordless phone in your house, microwave ovens, Bluetooth frequencies, you've got a lot of other devices that use those frequencies. And you'll notice that when you're on your cordless phone, you may find that your wireless network throughput really goes down quite a bit just because of all the interference that's being created. If somebody's popping popcorn, suddenly your wireless network isn't working very well, and that's why. So we needed some additional standards. We needed to improve on A and B and come up with something that was better and faster and stronger. And it came to us in 802.11g. You can think of 802.11g as an upgrade to 802.11b. It used many of the same formats and still uses, for instance, the same frequency range, that 2.4 gigahertz range to communicate in. It went, however, 54 megabits per second. So you've got the, the same type of theoretical throughput as 802.11a. It was actually a little bit less because some of the overhead that is used in this technology. But you can probably compare them like to like if you're going to be really looking at them. One nice thing about 802.11g is that if you had an 802.11b device, it could still communicate to an 802.11g access point. The access points were backwards compatible. They used similar chipsets. And so it allowed us to, to roll out the 802.11g without having to change a lot of things with the infrastructure. You don't want to go to everybody's machine and put new wireless cards in there. You just put a new access point. And as the new people came in or you got some new cards, you could start rolling out the G cards and be able to get the increase in speed. But because it was 2.4 gigahertz, you still had these same frequency problems as 802.11b. We still needed something that could perhaps get around some of these issues. And that's why 802.11a was still in use, because nobody wanted to have any conflicts. So there had to be a happy medium somewhere. So we came up with a new format called 802.11n. The latest technology you'll find out there on our wireless networks is 802.11n. It was a standard that was created in 2009. So this is a relatively new idea in transmitting this wireless communication signal. One other nice thing about it is we were able to take a lot of the technologies from what we have learned up to this point with wireless networking and really implement it into a very single centralized standard. For instance, the 802.11n can operate at 5 gigahertz and or 2 gigahertz. So you've got some options when you start implementing these networks on how it will go. The idea is now you don't have to choose. Do I do A? Do I do B? Do I do G? You can do one standard and really apply that across everything. The speed on these is also dramatically improved over previous versions. You have a, a theoretical maximum throughput of 600 megabits per second on an 802.11n network, which is quite a bit improved over previous versions of wireless networking. Some of these improvements come from a technology called MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple output. And you'll notice on a number of 802.11n devices, you'll see multiple antennas at the top, and each of those antennas can hear and transmit over a different part of the wireless spectrum, therefore improving the amount of throughput through there. Now, that also increases the cost because there's multiple radios and multiple components and chipsets in there to be able to do it. But the improvement in speed may be well worth some of the difference in cost associated with that. I've summarized what all of these are then. So let's look here at our 802.11a, b, g, and n networks. I've summarized the frequencies that we've looked at and the maximum theoretical throughput for those networks. And I put in here an approximate range. This is really a guess, a roundabout number that you can use for at least a, a point of reference so that you can understand what were the real differences. 802.11a and b, well, they were about the same in practical use, 35, 40 meters or so. 802.11g networks improved to about 100 meters. And you should see about 300 meters of distance that you could get on these newer 802.11 networks.